Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Father, I just ask that you would take and seal to our hearts only that which is truth. I come into your presence boldly through the throne of grace by the access to, to your grace that you have given us. And I just ask that you would filter out any ignorance or foolishness, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this series of videos, we've been studying together in Romans, if you've been following along with us, and we left off talking about the importance of doctrine. I've been preparing for the next video in that series, but I'd like to just take a slight departure from that verse where we left off in order to address some of the questions that I received regarding what this ministry is teaching as a whole. I think that's important uh, and especially when people ask me to do so. The fact is we are living in an age and at a time in which modern Christianity has little concept of who Jesus is and what he did. Sermon after sermon after sermon that I hear is, is about what man must do for God, how the Christian ought to appease God, how he ought to sacrifice for God, how that in short he ought to earn God's grace, which is junk. I, I don't know what other word to use. Where is the serious realization that this book, the Word of God, is about Christ? There's little comprehension of doctrine. Doctrine divides. Modern Christianity has reversed God's order from our dependence upon Him to His being dependent upon us, if you can imagine that, the exact opposite of sound biblical doctrine. I pointed that I, I've tried to point this out in every video that I've ever made, in every sermon I've ever preached. I'm, I made the statement I don't know how long ago. If one of you married men was in bed with a prostitute when Christ came, you'd be caught up together with him in the air, and he'd say, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant." And a bunch of people were shocked at that. All of the people who are shocked are people who don't realize that you are complete in Christ. Now, do you want to do that? Do you want to go and do that? That you are obedient. You're not disobedient. If you are a son of disobedience, folks, you're a son of the devil. We don't have to go very far into the New Testament to find out that we are obedient children. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Those who are born of God can not commit sin. Most Christians don't believe that. They have virtually no comprehension of the finished work of Christ. It continues to be astounding to me. Somebody can commit two murders and two rapes and go to prison. Some evangelist leads them to Christ, and then two weeks after he's out, he's, he's preaching in a big pulpit. That's okay. That's wonderful. That's the grace of God. But if somebody who professes Christ does that, man, he's going to go to hell. He's under the wrath of God. He's going to go through the tribulation and who knows what else. Why? Why? What happened? If you believe 
that there is any way that the wrath of God is directed towards you. Folks, you don't know this book. You simply don't know this book. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We talk about the finished work of Christ, and, and I, don't, I don't know how much people know about that. People write books on the finished work of Christ and then turn out making it unfinished. He forgave some of your sins, but, but not others. He didn't deliver you. He didn't really deliver you from his wrath. His, his wrath is going to catch up with you. It's going to fall on you. What kind of thinking is that? If we look at the finished work of Christ, the Christ, the job that he had to do, what did he finish? He had a job to do. There were those of us who are we're estranged from God. Please understand biblical truth. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Your choice had nothing to do with that. You did not choose me, but I chose you, said the Lord. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, predetermined, to be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And yet, 90% is my estimate of Christianity makes you blameable, reprovable, and unholy. Christ didn't do enough. There was a price that needed to be paid for sin. And there's all kinds of silly suggestions that that price was paid to Satan. It, it was not. It was not. There was a price paid to God because of sin. And that we call redemption. Redeemer and redeemed are two of the most precious words. The word means to pay a price. It means ransom. You and I were bought with a price. Now I want to cover a lot in this video, so I'll probably move fairly, fairly quickly through my notes here. Ransomed. The word describes that we were in the marketplace, and because of sin, we were going to die. <clears throat> the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And Christ bought us. He bought us. And he brought us out of that place of sin. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For ye are bought with a price, therefore Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, let's look at the way that most Christians look at that verse. Let's look at how most Christians that I know look at that verse. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. What if you don't glorify God in your body and in your spirit? What if you don't do that? Wait a minute. You didn't read the verse. Your body and your spirit are whose? Are God's. He bought you. You can't take that verse and rip it apart. God is very dogmatic. You were bought with a price. You didn't pay it. You did not pay it. Christ paid it. 1 Corinthians 7.23 You are bought with a price, therefore don't be servants of sin. Well, what if, well, Steve, what if you are a servant of sin? 
you're no longer bought with a price. Seriously, where do you have any right to say that? You're not a servant of sin. I don't know how many Christians that I've talked to. Romans 6, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin. Well, Steve, I've tried that 50 times, and I still sin. As, as if that's, that's reckoning is supposed to keep you from sinning. The reckoning is because you sin. It didn't say anything about sinning, stop stopping sinning. It said logically, look at the facts. You're dead to sin. That's where we're kind of at in our Roman study. That's the logical truth. You are. Well, well, Steve, I don't look like it. You sure don't. I don't even try and hide that fact. I won't try and hide that fact from you. You don't look like it. But you are. You are. You are dead to sin or God's a liar. Second Peter 2.1 but there were false prophets also among you, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall come in and bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And that is what you do when you say that you're not complete. You're not sinless. When you're under the guilt of sin, that's what you do. You bring in a damnable heresy. When you say, when you say that I said a terrible thing that that man would be caught up to God, and God would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If that isn't true, then Christ didn't pay enough. We always look at the big things. The big things. We always do. But, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you. Well, what about that person that commits fornication? Wait a minute, I'd like to go to the uncleanness, okay? What about the guy that broke the speed limit speeding through my town? What about the husband that had an unkind thought about his wife? Are they also under the wrath of God? Damnable heresy, that's what it is. What you have done, what you've done, is demean what Christ did. There's another word for ransom or redeemed. Latruo, Latruo really means to be set free. To be set free. Matthew 20, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many, not for all, for many. If he gave his life a ransom for you, what greater price do you want paid? Are you going to suggest that a little suffering or a little difficulty or, or a little punishment plus the price that Christ paid, is better than the price that Christ paid. Mark 10, 45. And even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Titus. Two, who gave himself for us. Us. Don't minimize that. Don't demean it. Don't reduce it. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Well, he almost did that, but there's that guy that went with that prostitute. 
And what you're saying is, what you're saying is he didn't redeem you from all iniquity. If he didn't redeem you from all iniquity, then he lied. Your theology says he lied. Who gave himself in our place. The word for there is who pair. It's substitutionary. I got an angry email one time that the, the death of Christ was not substitutionary. And, and all, all I know immediately is that the writer of that email has never studied this book or, or any Greek. Who gave himself in our place. Think of it. That's why you don't want to sin. That's why you don't want to sin. If you don't want to sin because you're afraid of God's wrath or you're going to miss something, you're an idiot. I, I'll, I'll be as blunt as I can be. You don't want to sin because he gave himself in your place. Our present area of study, Romans 6. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Well, now, now we're going to have seven chapters on, on how we don't sin doesn't say that he said of course not of course not God forbid how can you live in sin if you're dead to sin that's what it says that's what it that's what the text says and people read it by the thousands and try to figure out well I'm not supposed to sin that grace may abound so so what do I do about that you can't that's what it says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's that simple. If the Spirit of Christ is not in you, you're not His. Romans 8. Man does not have the Spirit of Christ. He is none of His. You think the spirit of this age and the spirit of Christ can dwell together in a believer? You are his child. You are an obedient son. Because Jesus Christ was your obedience. His obedience, not yours, his, who gave himself in our place that he might redeem us from well, some iniquity. Uh, that's what people read. There's some iniquity. Boy, you, you got a real problem. From all iniquity is what the text says. And purify unto himself a very valuable people, a peculiar people. That means a valuable people. These people are zealous of good works. You're zealous of good works because you're redeemed. And then 1 Peter 1.18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver, gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, dearly beloved, was it sufficient? Was it really sufficient? And then there's the last Greek word for redeem. There are three, uh, which, is, which is ex agorazo, ex Ek means that you're taken out of the marketplace. Really, you'd translate that. You're taken out of marketability is how you would translate that. 
it's something that's no longer sold. You don't go in and out of sin. You don't go in and out of the old life. You don't go in and out of being holy and unblameable and unreprovable. You're, you're out of that area. You're a thing so precious, folks, that it can't be bought or sold anymore. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Are you under the law? Or do you believe, God, that you are not under law, but under grace? Do you believe that? If you're not under the law, there's no sin. How can you sin if there's no law? Now, wait a minute, Steve. How can you say, how can you say that we don't sin? How can you say that? Because that's what God said. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Romans 7, 20. The verse is not saying sin has ceased. What it's saying is, it is saying it is no longer you that does it. How can that be? Because you have two natures. His seed abides in us, that is in, in the new man, and it cannot sin. It doesn't even have the power or the ability to sin. That new creation does not sin. This is a such a vital truth, folks, that, that when, mi when missed, explains much of the error of modern Christianity, which believes that its only option is to function out of the old man, the flesh, in which there dwells no good thing, which does nothing but sin. The Father in Christ cannot sin. The Father can't sin. Christ can't sin. The seed of God remains with us, and we have no power, no ability to sin. God did not redeem the flesh, and neither can we. The things I would, I do not, said Paul, and the things I would not, these I allow. O wretched man that I am. How are we delivered from the body of that death? Through Jesus Christ. Through Christ. Not additional suffering, not some kind of punishment, not some kind of wrath, not through law, not through works. Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, 5. Galatians 4, 5. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption. Adoption of sons. We're his son. We're his children. Adoption, folks, has an eschatological or, or, or prophetic inference. Even the redemption of our body, it's not redeemed. That's, that's why it sins. That's the first aspect of the finished work of Christ. It is the price paid for sin. It is the aspect of the finished work of Christ that deals with sin, deals with sin, deals with the issue of sin. And the scriptures are abundantly crystal clear that he did a finished job. Sin is a past consideration in your life because you love him. We pass laws and say, Thou shalt not do this, and people will do everything in the world to get around it. But when you love him, when you love Christ, how, for those of you who love him, we love him because he first loved us. How can we live in, in sin any longer? And always, always, somebody says, but, but what if you do? Well, then God's a liar. 
He didn't do enough. And, and folks, I don't see how you can do that. So we have been redeemed. We've been redeemed, not according to anything that we did, and we now learn that the finished work of Christ is, is crucial as it regards our relationship to God. The sin issue is settled. It is settled. It shouldn't come up anymore. Does that alarm you to hear me say that? It's true. It's settled. What about our relationship to God? We're reconciled. Reconciliation is not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. It has nothing to do with sorrow. Repentance says, I no longer follow the flesh, I follow God. A change of mind. But that's not involved in the finished work of Christ. Christ paid the price for sin. We didn't. We didn't. And if you're going to tell me he didn't pay enough, well, that's your problem. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. He did. Now, now there's the problem of reconciliation. We were estranged from God. We were His enemies. We were not working for Him. We're not living for Him. There's none righteous. No, not one. But the sin question, the sin issue, is settled. The sin question is settled. But we've all gone out of the way. We need to be reconciled to God. He doesn't need to be reconciled to us. There isn't one verse. You can't find one verse of Scripture that ever says God was reconciled. We need to be reconciled to Him. And we were through the death of his son. We've got two words. Cotalasso. Romans 5.10. For, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. As it concerns the matter of redemption, we didn't have anything to do with it. Nothing. Nothing. No person, not one person on this planet can show me one verse that says that we're redeemed if we do anything. If we believe, receive, accept, come down the aisle, shake somebody's hand, have a personal relationship with Christ. All of those cliches. None of them are there. We are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in our place. Reconciled. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Well, Steve, yeah, but if you don't believe that, don't go, don't go there. Wait a minute. If you are his, chosen from in Christ before the foundation of the world, you are reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's what it says. That's what the text says. If you're going to argue with it, then you argue with God. Much more than... Being now reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Life. Not death, life. Reconciliation is followed by saved. Or saved is followed by recon reconciliation. Look, folks, I'll preach a sermon any day to God's redeemed and reconciled people, inviting them to be saved by his life. Saved. Delivered. You're redeemed and reconciled, and reconciled by his death. 
you're saved by the life of Christ. And people have been preaching for a hundred years. Well, a little longer than that, actually. That unredeemed people need saved. That they made that up. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We didn't have anything to do with it. And we are saved, delivered, sozo in the Greek, because he lives. Only redeemed individuals are saved. Romans 5.11 And not only so, but we joy in God by means of of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. You have the authorized version. It says atonement. They didn't mean that. We have now received the reconciliation. <clears throat> have received. Well, wait a minute, Steve. I didn't receive it. Well, God says you have. He reconciled us to himself by means of Jesus Christ. Not by means of your acceptance. By means of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18 And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by means of Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of that reconciliation. You're reconciled to God. Who did that? Christ. Didn't have anything to do with you. It's because you're his child that you're, you were reconciled. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world, that's the world religious system, unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of this reconciliation. The world religious system. It's all religious, even if you're, you call yourself an atheist. The world is not, you ought, to, you ought to do it. Or the word is not, you ought to do it. The word is, it's done. It's astounding to me. Somebody comes up and says, I'm, I'm going to preach the gospel. If you'll accept Christ, you'll go to heaven. They call that the gospel. Where? Where? What do we do? Make this book up? Therefore, I delivered unto you the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, all according to the scriptures. Where do you read? You got it. You had to do anything. It's not there. That's the gospel. That's grand news. That's the good news is what he did. The good news isn't what you got to do. The good news is what he did. He died for our sins, and when I realize what all that means, according to the scriptures, man, I think that's wonderful. If you believe that, then you're delivered from the fear of death, the law, and a whole bunch of, of other things. But whether you believe it or not, if you are his, he died for your sins. Then there's the word apokatalasso, which means to completely reconcile, with no doubt. Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Well, did he? Did he do that? How many thousands of Christians are hearing sermons about their problems in sin? He has abolished in his flesh the enmity which is contained in ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, do not. 
For to make in himself one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Oh, okay. Is it only half slain? Or is it slain? God's never touched you in wrath. He's never touched you in anger. He touches you, folks, in love. Colossians 1.20 And having made peace through the blood of his cross. That's how he made peace. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe that or not. He made peace by the blood of his cross to reconcile all things to himself. Helps if you believe it. By him, I say, whether there are things in earth or things in heaven, and you, you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. And now we have a whole bunch of people saying, well, there are still those who, Steve, there's still those who do wicked works. So they're still alienated. So they're not reconciled. But how were they reconciled? By the blood of his cross. Not by believing in the blood of his cross. Not by accepting the blood of his cross. But because he died in your place. Now reconciled in the body of his flesh by death. To present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Why is that so hard to believe? Why is it so difficult to think that God Almighty could not pay a sufficient price for me so that I stand before him spotless? You know, folks, with all of the ungodliness that exists in our world, the scandals that we see nightly on the news and on social media from individuals to political parties to governments to secular and religious institutions from, from, from this and that. And on every level, the only thing, the only thing in this universe that stands before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable is... You want to take a guess? You. The body of Christ. The child of God in Christ. And yet Christians by the millions view themselves little different than how God, basically how God views the world that doesn't know him. At least at times. The problem is that we had sin as a, as a great problem. Christ paid that. It's all done. The next problem is we're not reconciled to God. We were his enemies. Well, he reconciled us by the blood of his cross. God wasn't reconciled. We were. But we still have a further problem, that, and that's that God hates sin. That soul that sinneth, it shall die. So... God needs to be appeased. We call it propitiation. When the Day of Atonement came and they, and they sacrificed the lamb, the high priest, he'd go into the holiest of, of holies. Do you think that it depended on the belief of the crowd standing around as to whether or not it worked? When the nation of Israel came on that day, what did they have to do with it? What did they have to do with it? I think it's it's 
it's like 14 times in Leviticus. On that day thou shalt do no work. Thou shalt do no work. Thou shalt do no serve. Thou shalt do nothing. The high priest is offering a sacrifice for sin. Didn't matter what they did. They did nothing. Jesus Christ propitiated Almighty and eternal God. You're not propitiated. You didn't need to be appeased. John 2.2. 2. John 2.2. 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world and world's religious system. He is the complete appeasement for our sin. If you name one that has not been propitiated, then this verse is not true. And you can't do that. He's not the propitiation for our sins because we ask him to be. God is, he's, God is appeased by what? Looking at Christ, not looking at you. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Folks, not your travail, but Christ's. I've talked to any number of Christians. Well, that's true up until the day you accept Christ. They're all propitiated, but from then on, you got a problem. Folks, you can't do that. He's the propitiation for our sin. And this was written, by the way, it was written nearly 2,000 years before you ever committed a single sin. God is completely satisfied with you. The price was paid for the sin. We were reconciled to God, and he is totally appeased. And we haven't done a thing. Not one thing. No faith, no acceptance, no belief, no nothing to make that happen. Christ did it. Christ did it all. He did it. People are suffering through a, I say suffering, and I mean it, through a sermon for an hour on what they ought to do to be redeemed were that they then stand up afterwards and they sing, Jesus paid it all. Well, he did. He did. You either recognize the seriousness of these texts, folks, okay, or you don't. He died in your place. He died in your place. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? And you say, well, I saw him with a prostitute. I saw so-and-so with a prostitute. You go ahead and do it. I, you know, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not going to. Who shall lay any charge against God's elect? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who's there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus who died and more than that was raised to life is at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. He's your attorney, folks. Romans chapter 8. It is Christ that died for that sin. Was that payment sufficient? Well, my Bible says it was. And I believe yours does too. The world, the world is full of ministers who spend the whole week frantically searching for a text so that they can preach against the Democrats or the Republicans. or whatever. This book is not about that. 
I, I decided to spend some hours searching the, the TV. I do that late at night, channel surf, the Christian networks. And boy, I heard a ser- I heard sermon after sermon that made no biblical sense. And people shouting hallelujah and, and all that junk. Finally, I got a guy who I know that, I mean, not this man. Now, he's going to give me a good sermon. And he preached... He preached on how we're going to unseat the Democrats in his in his sermon. All it did was remind me of how Christ's Sermon on the Mount, where he did not exhort his followers to overthrow Nero. That's all I got out of that. I th- folks, I think it's that's pathetic. I really, I, I really do, dearly beloved. Take heed unto doctrine. For in doing this, you will deliver yourselves, as well as those that hear you. I hope this video has been an encouragement to some. I love you all. I truly do. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for just allowing me the opportunity to take and share your precious truth with these precious souls that listen. I ask that you filter out any error, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Till next time, thanks for watching.